Good morning, Liberty Northeast. It is so good to be with you guys this morning. Um, to see so many new faces, I know I might look like a new face. Um, like Evan said, my wife Lizzie and I have been here, been members here for two years now, but the majority of this year I've been away serving in the context that the Lord has let me. So um, it's good to be back with you all, good to share the stage with you. Um, but so one of the most influential aspects of World War I was the use of chemical warfare, the introduction of this. So the Imperial German Army in 1915 used chlorine gas against Canadian and French forces. And it did not take a very long time for the world to come to the conclusion that they need to put a regulation around this, that they need to put some type of ban. Um, and so that's, that's a consensus that the world came to, that uh, we should ban this from the battlefield. But that being said, the enemy does not always play by the rules of engagement. So today, soldiers train and prepare for chemical warfare. And one of the ways that they do this is by exposure to CS gas. So, so imagine this, one of your, your first days at training, you're ushered into the woods where there's not anybody around besides you and your group of soldiers. And there's one lone building, just one small room, one room building. And you're given a gas mask, you're divvied up into groups of 10 to 15 and ushered around the back where there's one door. And you're given quick instructions on how to use it. And then abruptly, the door is open and you're yelled at to get inside. So everybody runs in and you line the back wall. And although you're breathing in pure and clean air through the mask, an eeriness sets in. You can feel a little irritation and burn on the skin that's exposed. You can see little ripples in your vision, knowing that there's a chemical environment that you're around. And it's not going to be very long until that hits you. And shortly after you get in there, the instructors start making you do a bunch of exercises, jumping jacks, high knees, anything to get your heart rate up. Higher heart rate means heavy breathing. And then abruptly, you're told to turn to the side, put the arm on the shoulder in front of the person in front of you, take your gas mask off, and start singing whatever song they tell you to sing. Your heart rate's up, you're singing, so you're taking in air, and you are just breathing in that gas. Now, the reason that we do this training is to, for one, to instill faith and confidence in our equipment, in the mask, as we enter in and as we function in there for five minutes. And then, it's to reassure confidence and peace during chaos, during that time of exposure. Now, the most important detail that they tell you when you enter into that chamber is that there are two ways you can leave this room. There's a faithful way and there's an unfaithful way. There's a way that will lead to success and a way that will lead to failure. The faithful way is you keep the gas mask on, you do whatever they tell you to do, you take it off, you breathe in that gas, and when they tell you to walk out that door, you walk out that door. But some people panic. Sometimes it gets hard, it gets difficult, and people walk out before they're supposed to, or they refuse to take the mask off. And that results in a failure to train, and you are asked to leave. In that room, you have two doors, you have two gates, you have two ways. What decision are you making? Our passage today is at the tail end of the Sermon on the Mount. So all summer, we have been exploring how Jesus has been calling us to a new way of life as citizens of the kingdom of God. And a lot of the claims that Jesus has been telling us have been countercultural and counterintuitive. If you have hatred in your heart, you have already murdered your brother. You don't just commit adultery by committing adultery, but by lust in your eyes and lust in your heart. If someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to them the other one. If someone tells you to go one mile, go with them too. So as Jesus is beginning, he's, he's made these claims, he's made his point, and he's beginning to wrap up the sermon. He's about to land the plane. That's a, a term we use in homiletics for when you're wrapping up a sermon. So if Evan's ever up here one Sunday, just really going on, just give him one of these and he'll, uh, 
<laughs> It'll catch the cue. But uh, no, so Jesus is, he's landing the plane. He's made his points and now he's at his application. He's at his so what? So pick up with me in Matthew 7, verses 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. The image is clear. <clears throat> two gates, two ways. The easy gate, the easy way has a multitude of people there naturally. And the hard and difficult way has very few people there. But listen to Jesus's words. Listen to what he says beginning. Enter through the narrow gate. It is a command. It is an imperative statement. There are two options, but there is only one viable option for God's people. But what does this metaphor even mean? Right? Jesus talks like this a lot of times. What is he trying to communicate? If you uh, go to John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And four chapters later, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus identifies himself as the sole way to God the Father. And if that statement offends you today, good, good. We live in a society that pressures us and influences us to think that this statement is offensive because it's exclusive. The gospel is offensive because it is confrontational to our flesh, to our natural thoughts, to our natural desires. But that does not mean that we should remain in that offense. It just means that it's indicative of culture. Relativism, autonomy, pluralism. These are all of the idols of our world today influencing our thoughts. Ideas that say, my truth may be different than your truth, but they're both equally valid. Or that truth is just dependent on culture, time, society, place or that they're just multiple streams of authority. These idols make way for different soteriological thoughts, different thoughts about how salvation is achieved. So we're gonna have a quick pop quiz, all right? I'm gonna put four soteriological thoughts up on the board with four definitions. Just read over them and try and match them in your head really quick. Pluralism. All religions are equally valid. Universalism. Everyone will be saved, no matter, it's a typo, no matter the religion or lack thereof. Inclusivism. Christianity is true, but it is possible for one to be saved outside of conscious faith. Christ's person and work covers everyone. Exclusivism. Salvation comes through conscious faith in Jesus Christ alone. Three of these definitions are very lenient. Three of them are very soft, they're very kind, they're very approachable. One of them is offensive. One of them states that there is only one way, one path to salvation. One of them matches the words of Jesus in Matthew 7, 13 through 14, John 10, 9, and John 14, 6. Enter by the narrow gate. I am the door. I am the way. Brothers and sisters, there are two gates, two ways in this life. One is narrow and difficult. One is wide and easy. One is through conscious faith in Jesus Christ. The other is through any means that you see fit. And as we discover throughout this sermon, that as Jesus is calling us to a new way of life as citizens in the kingdom of God, we need to look away from what the world is telling us to do 
and look to the words of Jesus. So when you you feel the pressure of the world around you influencing you, when you feel that gas around you influencing you against the thoughts of exclusivity, that uh, thoughts of unfairness seep into your mind, when attempting to, to remain faithful in your walk, but life is just becoming difficult all around you and you're questioning the existence of God, when the car breaks down, you can't afford to fix it, when the children are acting up, when you can't get on the same page as your spouse, when you've applied to 20 jobs and you haven't heard back from one, cling to the words of Christ. The way that leads to life is difficult, is not easy. And that's why few are on it. Look to Christ, see through the lens of the new life that he has given you and breathe the new life that he has given you. The rest of the world will not do this. They won't. Many will be on the easy path that leads to destruction and many will turn away from Christ at the slightest inconvenience or doubt. If we are to heed Jesus's countercultural and counterintuitive words, we need to remain steadfast in our faith in Christ. And while Satan or others around you or your own fleshly desires may try and pull you away off that path, away from that gospel truth, fix your eyes and heart on the words of Christ here. Let's pick up in verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly ravenous wolves. Right away, Jesus is highlighting another aspect, another obstacle that makes walking this narrow path, this narrow way, pretty difficult. Individuals who are trying to tear you away from the gospel truth. Oftentimes, uh, the most destructive forces are the ones that look like us. They're not that different from us. Debunking some of the claims of Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, That's often kind of easy because they are so antithetical to the gospel. But what about the individual who looks like you, who smells like you, who's not that different from you? What about those who share much in common with us? In the Old Testament, almost every single time that the Lord spoke through the prophet Jeremiah, false prophets around him raised up. Jeremiah would say something hard to the people of God yet false prophets around him would rise up telling the people of God what they wanted to hear. They would say, peace, peace, and there was no peace. They said, you shall not see the sword. You shall not see famine. You shall have peace in this place. But they saw the sword, they saw famine, and they did not have peace. Jeremiah told them that they would see exile. He told them of the destruction of the temple. And the people of God listened to the voices that they wanted to hear and they were led astray. Wolves in sheep's clothing. What happens when the wolves come and they look like sheep? They are kind. They are soft. They are not abrasive. They're not intrusive. They tell you what you want to hear. What happens when the wolves invade the pulpit? Telling you that Jesus He's not the only way. He's not the only truth. He's not the only life. Hell, it's not a real place. It can't be. And if it is, it can't be eternal. There's no way that an all-powerful and all-loving God could send sinners to hell. What happens when they invade the pulpit? For centuries, Satan has been trying to tear apart the church. There have been and there will continue to be wolves in sheep's clothing. And if we are to discern these voices, we need to know the voice of God. We need to be a community that is so infused and immersed in the word of God that we can easily delineate them. If you ask an unbeliever, why do good things happen to bad people? They'll probably struggle with this question, wrestle with it. Or use this as a case in point to say there can't be a God. But if you ask a believer who is immersed in this text, they can easily say that no one is good. No one is righteous. Not one. That all have sinned. All have fallen. All are short of the glory of God. 
that God gave us up to the desires of our flesh because that is what we wanted. And that might not be easy to say, but abiding in the word of God is what gets us there. And the wolves and sheep's coming are ravenous and they're, they're here. It's a reality, but there is a greater reality that Christ will establish and he has established his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So as a, a new way of life, this means that we need to stand on guard, stand ready to discern what is being taught to us, be people of the word, testing everything that is told. We don't just keep it here, but we go home and we spend time in prayer and in the word, testing everything that is told to us. We are people on guard. And how else do we differentiate the wolves in sheep's clothing? Verse 16, you will recognize them by their fruits. 30 miles northeast of us up the road is Princeton Theological Seminary. And 20 miles west of us is Westminster Theological Seminary. And if you don't know the the historical difference or uh, just background between these two, Westminster was actually birthed out of Princeton. As Princeton was formed in 1746, it boasted a vast array of incredible theologians such as A.A. Hodge, Charles Hodge, B.B. Warfield, J. Gresham Machen, incredible theologians who paved the way for future generations to come. But in 1929, a group of Princetonian professors left the university and founded Westminster Theological Seminary. And the reason? Princeton was no longer bearing fruit. Their roots were not grounded in Christ, but rather the ideologies and theologies of the world. For a little bit of more context behind this uh, circumstance, the late 19th and early 20th centuries were monumental in church history. The Enlightenment and Industrial Revolution had brought so much advancement and progress to the new world, advancement and progress that we had not seen before, that it shifted our way of thinking. We became a progressive nation instead of a conservative nation, not politically, but ideologically. For centuries past, we always function through the mindset that we are going to hold fast to the true and tried ways, the old ways of doing things. These are the best ways to do things. And at the, at the, the development of the Industrial Revolution and the Enlightenment push on and influence society, it transitions our thinking into innovative thoughts. What is new? What is next? We need to push off the old ways of doing things. And Darwin applied this thinking as he published Origin of Species, which he first starts to talk about the theory of evolution. And so with all these advancements and developments in society, these, these trains of thought and thinking start to influence the church in these seminaries. And questions of the inerrancy of scripture, is, is scripture really perfect? Is it without error? Or, or the miraculous workings within scripture, the resurrection of Christ, did that actually happen? These are the thoughts that are starting to get provoked in churches and seminaries. And, and from this movement comes the social gospel, which talks about how charity and responsibility and community and, and, and social responsibility was the key to salvation, that this is the essence of the gospel. Right, this, this new type of Christianity permeated the churches and the seminaries. And we have the privilege of being able to see the fruit or lack thereof a hundred years later. A hundred years later, we have churches that assert that the word of God is not an errant, that it is not perfect, it's just written by man. There's many errors in translation. We have churches that assert that Jesus never rose from the grave. That the essence of the gospel is doing good for your neighbor on your own accord instead of telling them them that they are lost and they are in need of a savior. Churches that support the genocide of unborn children or affirm same-sex marriage all birthed out of a diminished view, a low view of scripture. These are new developments in Christianity. They are not historical precedents. They are bad fruit that we can see 
from, from wolves in sheep's clothing a hundred years ago. You will recognize them by their fruit. This theological liberalism first hit Europe a hundred years ago, and now it is a post-Christian nation, and it is affecting America in the same way. Wolves in sheep's clothing tried to shift the narrative away from the true gospel, away from the exclusivity of Christ. And we can tell this now. If we understand that Jesus is calling us to a new way of life as citizens in the kingdom of God, we need to look at the fruit around. We need to be okay with not looking like the rest of culture. When we see bad fruit, don't eat it. Just as as many of you might experience apprehension with uh, children and youth programs, what your children are being taught, what they're being indoctrinated with, because wherever they go, they are being indoctrinated with something. You need to have the same defense for yourself. What the world deems as good fruit is not always what Jesus deems as good fruit. Be on defense, be a discerning person, looking through the lens and breathing through the new life of Christ. Verses 16 through 20. Are grapes gathered from thorn brushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Thorn bushes and thistles do not bear fruit. The harvester is able to discern the good fruit or the good tree from the bad tree by looking at the fruit, just by looking at the quality of fruit that it produces. And every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. They can only survive so long. In Acts chapter 5, Gamaliel, a member of the Sadducees party, is, is speaking with some other Sadducees about this new church movement, about what the apostles are doing. And even though he is outside of the church, he has a very important statement that he makes, that if this is a movement of God, It cannot be stopped. And in his thought process, he's thinking to the earlier days, earlier movements that he's seen, where other so-called religious leaders who who proclaimed themselves as a Messiah um, rose up and they quickly drifted away. So in Acts chapter 5, he says, Before these days, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed. And all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him, he too perished and all who followed him were scattered. Came to nothing, they were scattered. Trees that do not bear fruit, good fruit, cannot hide. They will be exposed. They will be cut down. The easy way and the wide gate leads to destruction. And the way that leads to life is difficult and it is hard. As I as I had to place my faith in that mask as I walk into the building, I knew that there's only one faithful way to get out of that room. There's gonna be hardship, there's gonna be suffering. However, at some point that metaphor breaks down. I had to take the mask off. I had to take my faith off, and I had to get through it alone. In this example, it's, it's really just faith and works, but that is not what Jesus is reminding us in Matthew 7. Jesus is never asking us to step away from our faith and have reliance on ourself. He himself is the door. He himself is the way, nothing else. Life is long and full of hardship. And the only way to walk the narrow path is through faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And others may come along you trying to convince you that this is a lie, might try and tear you off of that path, telling you that there are different ways to live, there are different truths out there, truth is subjective, that you can live however you want to. If we are to endure till the end, we need to live in a way that does not look like the rest of culture and the way that is not always intuitive. I am the resurrection and the life, and the one who believes in me will live, 
even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Does not get any more counterintuitive than that. Jesus has offered himself to us as the way. And even though that way is narrow, it is definitive. It is true. It is a promise. We do not need to look like the world. We do not need to smell like the world. Jesus is telling us to place faith solely in him, that others will try and come tell you false lies and pull you off of that path. And they will try and divide the church. The narrow way is difficult, is hard, and few will stay on it. The wide way, the wide gate, many will be there. Where will you place your faith and what way will you walk? I invite you to pray with me as we close out. Lord, we thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to proclaim your word, God. I pray that your voice through scripture, that your Holy Spirit, you would be convicting us as a people, purifying your bride, making us more like you every single day, that we would leave here renewed and ready for a new week to give you glory, honor, and praise. It's in your name we pray. Amen.